Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship. Also, happy Father's Day to all fathers and grandfathers, and we just want to give thanks to the Lord today for all the men in our lives that God has sent to nurture us and to teach us his way. So happy Father's Day, dads. Next Sunday is what we call a Reach Out Sunday, meaning it's a combined worship service. There will be no 8.30 service, just one at 11 o'clock, and that's because it's the church picnic day. So feel free to come dressed casually, and in the bulletin you can find out information about what to bring. But we hope that you will join us for what will be a beautiful day together of joy and fellowship. And now I'd like to invite Diane Falk to come and share with us uh, a moment for safety. Good morning. Well, the safety committee has been busy, mostly behind the scenes, and today is going to be another first in Beulah's history. Uh, this morning we had our first ever fire drill from the sanctuary for the first service. We're going to do it again and you're going to get to participate. Uh, we're gonna have a slightly abbreviated service today, and at the end of the service, I'll be giving you some instructions on what to do, since we've never done this before in the sanctuary. So uh, that's something to think about while you're at the service. It's going to be an interesting day. Um, if you're wondering why we're doing this, it's not because we like to make people walk outside of doors. It's been a recommendation from the insurance company, from the fire chief, the police chief, and others. And among the things, you know, if you've ever participated in one, once you walk the path you need to go, you learn a little bit about what to do. And you become a little more calm if there ever is an emergency. So we're all going to learn how to calmly walk out of this sanctuary and come back in. So that's going to be the morning. I just want to say a special thank you to the safety committee. This committee was formed six years ago, and Diane has chaired this committee all that time, and they have done really a marvelous job of researching and planning and discussing, discussing and working hard on our behalf to ensure that the people that use this building are as safe as possible. So it is important uh, to have this fire drill today uh, on a Sunday morning in the sanctuary because in any emergency situation, even if one person doesn't know what to do, that one person is not only a safety hazard to themselves, but could also be to other people as well. So we thank you for your cooperation and uh, let's worship God. Please rise as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Hallelujah, servants of God, praise, praise the name of the Lord. Bless the Lord's name now and always. Praise the Lord's name here and in every place from east to west.
Please go ahead and be seated. Holy God, we worship you this day with joy and thanksgiving. You are awesome and holy, King of kings and Lord of lords. Your faithfulness and goodness abundantly blesses us. Even though you love us perfectly, in our humanity we are rebellious and follow our own ways that are not right in your sight. Forgive our foolishness and sinful ways. Have mercy on us. Hear us now as we silently confess our sins before you now. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. I want to encourage you to take the Bibles out from under the chair in front of you. They're on little shelves there. We're going to look at portions of John chapter 11 today, and you can find that on, let's see here, page 873 in those Bibles. Now, the story that we're looking at this morning is when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This story is the climax of the Gospel of John. If you look at all the other Gospels, they structure their account of Jesus' life pretty much chronologically, but not so in the Gospel of John. Many commentators see that John's story is structured around seven different miracle stories. Each of these miracle stories reveals Jesus' identity as God himself. And the seventh of these miracle stories is the one that we're looking at today, the story of Lazarus. And as I say, it's the climax of the Gospel of John. This is also the crucial event that directly brings about Jesus' death. Later in the chapel, chapter, after the miracle, the Jewish leaders begin to plot against Jesus. We're told in verse 53, so from that day on, they planned to put him to death. But let's begin now at John chapter 11, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. 
Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, the Christian community to which John was writing would have known very well the stories about Lazarus and Mary and Martha. The other Gospels tell us that Jesus often stayed with this family during his travels. And so, obviously, Jesus was quite close to these two sisters and brother. So when Lazarus became ill, it was very natural for the sisters to send for Jesus and ask him to come and help their brother. Now, given Jesus' relationship with this family, one would think that he would have gone to Bethany at once to help his friend. But he didn't. He spent two more days where he was, and then he told his disciples that they needed to go. But by this time, it was dangerous for Jesus to go anywhere near Jerusalem. Bethany was just a couple of miles away from the capital city. In chapter 10, we read that presumably the last time that Jesus was in Jerusalem, he enraged the Jewish leaders even more with his teaching, particularly when he said, the Father and I are one. They tried to arrest him at that time, but they were unsuccessful. So it wasn't safe, really, for Jesus to travel to Bethany at this point. But this really had nothing to do with Jesus' delay in going to see his friend. In verse 11, we pick up, Jesus said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So clearly, Jesus had a plan a plan to reveal his identity in a way that even the disciples had not yet seen. They arrived at Bethany and they discovered that Lazarus was not only dead, but that he had been buried as well. Picking up again in verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now the idea of the resurrection on the last day appears many times in the chapters of John's Gospel. Jesus is the one who will raise the dead. That authority has been given to him by God the Father. Verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. Now, this is the definitive I am statement. I am the resurrection and the life. One of the statements that we have been talking about since we began our study of the Gospel of John, Jesus makes these I am statements such as, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, and so on. And when he does this, it's, it's a declaration of his divinity. Because as you might remember in the book of Exodus, when God, in a sense, introduced himself to Moses, he said, I am, when Moses asked his name. And so the Jews came to understand, I am 
as God. And Jesus made these I am statements. Now the story goes on to say that Martha went back to the house to find her sister Mary and to bring her to Jesus. And when Jesus saw Mary's sorrow and the sorrow of the community that had gathered around her, we are told Jesus wept. It's a very simple but profound statement, and it's a little glimpse into the loving heart of Jesus. Picking up again then at verse 38. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and the stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upwards and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Now with this miracle, Jesus gave a clear sign that his authority was from God, authority even over death itself. This miracle looked forward to Jesus rising from the dead, and it affirms that all who believe in him will also have victory over death. Jesus stands over and above and beyond these limitations we know as birth and death. But it's not just the resurrection that will come for believers someday. It is the power that is available here and now for all who have faith in Jesus Christ. Resurrection power. There's a little story that is told by Presbyterian pastor and author Tim Keller. It's a story about a minister who was traveling in Italy. And at one point, he saw the grave of a man who had died centuries before, who was apparently an unbeliever and completely against Christianity, maybe even a little afraid, too. But the man had this huge stone slab put over his grave, huge, thick. And he did that so that he would not have to be raised from the dead, just in case it was going to happen. And written on the slab was this, I do not want to be raised from the dead. I don't believe in it. Well, evidently, when he was buried, an acorn must have fallen into the grave. And so a hundred years later, the acorn had grown up through the grave and this tree split that slab in two pieces. It was now a towering oak tree. The minister looked at it and he said, if an acorn, which has the power of biological life in it, can split a, stab, a slab of that magnitude, then what can the acorn of God's resurrection power do in our lives? So Tim Keller goes on to say that when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then the power of the Holy Spirit comes into our lives. That is the power of the resurrection the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And he goes on to explain how there are often things in our lives that keep us trapped, 
keep us in dark places, things that keep the Holy Spirit from really transforming our character and our behavior, things like bitterness and anger, insecurity, self-doubt, fear, and anxiety. But it is the power of the resurrection that can split these things and make you victorious over whatever it is that holds you captive. The more you know Jesus, the more your roots can grow down deep in him, the more you can submit yourself fully to him. That resurrection power is available to you here and now. So friends, our joy and our hope is not just at some future date when we get to see the glory and experience the power of, the God, of God in its fullness. But it's also the resurrection power available to us here and now in our daily lives. Let's pray. Oh, loving God, we thank you so much for the hope and the promise of life beyond death. And yet when we look at our daily lives so often, we really don't experience much in the way of resurrection power. So I pray for each one of us this morning that you would pour out your Holy Spirit anew upon us. That all the things that keep us captive would be split in half and would roll away in the face of your resurrection power. Lord, transform us to become more and more like Jesus and empower us and guide us each step of the way. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> Join me in prayer. Almighty God of all creation, we join our voices to praise you today, singing of your wonders, giving thanks for your grace and care, and celebrating the joys of life you have blessed us with, family and friends, new relationships and deeper relationships, new life and transformed lives. 
reconciliation, and restoration. On this day, we are especially grateful for the gifts of fathers, grandfathers, and other significant men in our lives that have helped to nurture us and grow in the faith, for the gifts of being a father, and for fathers that we miss. We also pray for comfort for those with difficult memories and feelings and to redeem them. Lord, give your love of justice to those who rule our land. Help them to rule with wisdom and compassion so that the poor and powerless may be treated fairly and with justice. Open their ears to the cries for help from those caught in cycles of poverty, abuse, or violence. Give them wisdom to know how best to respond and courage to do the right thing. We remember in our prayers this week our prayer families, Donna Strawbridge and Beverly Nithman. We also remember our homebound member, especially Melrose Weitzel. We also remember this week Bob and Helen Robin Renka on the death of Bob's father, particularly poignant today. Lord, hear all our prayers, spoken and unspoken, and when we can't find the words or our requests fall short, accept the prayer your son taught us to say and the one we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. For the blessings of this in all our days, we thank you, gracious God. Accept, we pray, not just this money, but also our lives, freely offered in gratitude for all you have done for us. Use them both in this place and wherever you might take us. Amen.
Right after the benediction, I'm going to ask that you be seated and we will get started with the instructions for the fire drill. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and encourage you with the knowledge of his resurrection power at work in your life. And may you go from this place full of joy and thanksgiving because you have victory in the Lord. I bless you as you go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now comes the interesting part. Well, in addition to what I said this morning about the insurance company and uh, the police and the fire wanting us to do this, the important thing is for everyone to learn what to do safely in case of an emergency. It, I can't place enough emphasis on the need to learn what to do in that in that event. So when the alarm does sound, what we need to do is get up and walk to the nearest exit quietly and safely. There are two exits up here in the front, one on each side. They go out onto sidewalks along the edge of the sanctuary. Just walk to the corner of the sanctuary. That's as far as we need to go today. If it was a real emergency, we would go across the road to the parking lot over there. If you're closer to the back, you can go out either of the two exits at the back of the sanctuary. Go out this right to me, left to you door, and go around the corner to a door you might not be aware of. It also comes out to that sidewalk and go to the corner of the sanctuary. The door over here on my left and your right, go out that and go left to the front door and go out and down the sidewalk. Just a note, Never use the doors to the garden as an emergency exit. And the reason for that is depending on where a fire might be, you can be trapped because they will lock behind you. So we don't ever want somebody to be caught in that position. So today, like I said, we're only gonna to walk to the outside corners of the sanctuary. If it were a true emergency, we'd walk across the road. And depending on where you are in the building, you go to the far end of the parking lot on the end of the building where you were at. But today, we're not going to go far. There are a few chairs staged outside for those who might need to sit once they get out there. And if walking is difficult for you, please remain in your seat. This is not an attempt to try to make somebody do hurdles when they don't need to. Someone will sit with you. Those people have some bright vests that they've, I've seen a few just put on just now. In a real emergency, the fire department tells us that that's necessary and that we can't help you. And the reason is because we would have more people in here who need to be rescued. So they want the people who can get out to leave and they will help. A fireman with air and equipment will help people who have more difficulty walking. So while it sounds harsh, we care very much about you and we want to do the safest thing for everybody. Parents, the teachers are going to take your children outside from wherever they are. And Carolyn, you can collect children and, and leave the sanctuary now. The reason is, parents, please don't go look for your children somewhere in the church. You need to leave. Their teachers have been taught, and they will take the children outside, and then, again, in a true emergency, we'll all gather together when we get to the parking lot out there. So we're going to practice it today so the kids get to do that. And by the way, the kids this morning thought it was great. And last, once we go outside, we're going to wait just a few minutes to be sure everyone's out and then we'll come back in. I should note here, I forgot to mention earlier, we learned this morning the bell does not sound very loudly in here. It's a big lesson learned to us and we're going to work on that. So it's not gonna be loud. If the organ were playing, you couldn't hear it. So once we come back in, we wanna talk over what went well and what we perhaps need to change in the future. You're welcome to stay here or go enjoy some refreshments as you choose. It only took a few minutes this morning. And with that, I think the bell may sound soon. <laughs>